This is the first of two lectures in the Water Birth Workshop. You may wish to print the PDFs of the slides and bibliography before you start watching this. This lecture focuses on key pieces of literature which can help provide a platform for evidence-informed practice around water birth. We know that water has been used during labour and birth for a very long time, as this summary of oral history tells us. It is deeply embedded through many societies. The use of a warm bath in labour has been recorded in the medical literature for over 200 years. American midwife Linda Church found it made its debut in the French scientific literature in 1803 when it was reported a warm bath was used to help an exhausted woman after a 48-hour labour. The woman gave birth in the water soon after entering the bath. There are very few other mentions of water birth until the 1980s when, in 1983, Michel O'Dont's Birth Under Water article was published in The Lancet. He recorded an analysis of his first 100 water births at Petivier. The year prior to this, Eric Seidenblatt, and I hope I've pronounced his name correctly, had published a knowledge capture on water birthing in the text called Water Babies, Igor Tchaikovsky and his work. Each country, and in fact each district, will have its own history of water birthing, and I do recommend you explore this, because this will have influenced attitudes and the availability of services in your local area. I have put my article, Water Birth in New Zealand, History and Politics, in the resources, which will give you an historical context for New Zealand. If you have any historical materials from where you live, please feel free to add them into the practice reflection and knowledge sharing areas. If you have ever attended a water birth where the woman controls the environment, and by that I mean she sets up her own birth space, placing the pool where it suits her, rather than her caregiver or institution, then you are likely to have seen this intimate scene where her partner or supporter helps to protect this space. It can include children, both during labour and for the birth itself, or immediately afterwards. This photograph is about undisturbed labour, where the environment is calm and safe, and where the caregiver respects this and does not disturb that tranquillity and safety. If this birth scene is familiar to you, you are also most likely to have seen that phenomenal transition from the eyes closed, apparently shut off woman in labour, as in the photo on the left, to the emotionally raw triumph of the photo on the right. I have posted a clip from the DVD, um, the 2001 DVD, Born in Water, A Sacred Journey, and this is for you to watch after the lecture. I have put it in the practice reflection and knowledge sharing area under the heading The Midwife and the Birth Space. It focuses on the impact, positive and negative, of our presence. After watching that DVD, do reflect on it and share your thoughts. The other thing you will see with pool use where the woman is left to choose her own positioning is the freedom with which various positions are adopted to cope with the strength of labour and to sleep and rest. This is the flipping and floating that women do in labour in water. My apologies for not having the sources of these photos acknowledged. There was an interesting little pilot study done by Stark and others in 2008 which is referenced in your bibliography. There were only seven women in total in the study, but there were nearly 200 quarter-hourly observations uh, which were done to look at any differences in the number of movements made in labour between three women in the water and four women on beds. 
Just over 89% of the positions observed in the bed labouring women involved a semi-reclining position. It was obvious right from the beginning that the women on the beds moved less, but towards the end of their labours the bed birthers did not move their pelvis at all and had hardly any rhythmic movements of their bodies, while the women in water continued to move. This little study typifies what one sees in practice when women are not cast on beds. In Barbara Harper's guideline for water births, she gives a long list of benefits and I'll give you some time to read this. Of all the benefits, it's been my experience that the one most commonly expressed by women after birth was the ability to deal with pain and labour. In looking at the evidence, I have drawn on two reviews in particular. The first is the 2014 analysis of peer-reviewed literature on waterbirth done by Elizabeth Nutter and her colleagues. And I've put this paper up in the resources so you can follow up beyond this overview with the best of the studies itemised in their analysis. The second one is the systematic review done by Elizabeth Cluett and Ethel Burns in 2009. The evidence from systematic review affirms my own experience. Women report less labour pain, reduced use of anaesthesia and analgesia in all types. The large observational study that Geisboller and others did over nine years is informative. It involves just over 9,500 births, of which 3,617 were water births. Over 69% did not need any analgesia with water, compared to 58% of land birthing women. While this is statistically significant, the differences were even greater when epidural on its own was singled out, 0.2% for water birthing women and 66 .6 for land birthing women. This slide shows that there is less perineum with water birthing than with land birthing. And to paraphrase Nutter and others, it seems there are less severe tears and more intact perineums also. If we look at infection and water birthing, Guy's Buller's report uh, reported half the use of prophylactic antibiotics for water birthing women and one third less therapeutic use than when compared to land births. The major indicators for use in both birth modalities were foul smelling lochia, endometritis or endomyometritis. Nutter's analysis draws attention to the fact that while many of the 13 reviewed studies were reassuring that there had been no excess infection risk for mothers in water birthing, Many of the studies had failed to say how infection was assessed and measured. This, along with other factors in an analysis, impact on the generalizability and interpretation of results. Methodological issues prevent definitive conclusions, especially with small studies, but waterborne babies appear to benefit from a washout effect, so there is less group B streptococcus and colonisation. The cleanliness of the plumbing is absolutely paramount. There have been cases of Legionella infection which, as the name suggests, causes pneumonia in the newborn. In the water source itself, I had an experience once of turning up to a labour where a woman was lying in brown silt-laden water. 
I couldn't actually see her feet because it was so murky. The river that supplied their water was in flood following torrential rain. As her membranes were still intact, we figured it was fine for labour, but she got out for the birth, just in case. The Cluet and Burns Cochrane Review and Nutter's Review both agree. There is no evidence of increased res risk of infection to mother or baby with the use of water for labour and or birth, but the studies are variable in size, definitions, matched groups, and many of the other aspects which can limit the ability of reviews to be definitive of care. The most effective way to measure blood loss is by checking the haemoglobin before and after birthing. Gauchbuller did just this and found significantly less blood loss with water birthing. In Hannah Darlin's study comparing birth and water in six positions on land, she, found, she and her colleagues found increased PPH when women birthed on birth stools. But of course it is easier to measure the blood loss caught in a bowl as opposed to that in a birth pool. Estimating the blood loss after water birth is often a case of thinking about whether the woman is wearing pink tights or red tights. But this assessment is also very dependent on whether or not the woman is moving in the pool. If she is very still, she can have a considerable blood loss underneath her, which may not be easily seen. It is a case of being watchful of the whole and continuing process of birthing, rather than getting fooled into thinking that labour and birth happens in discrete stages, as obstetric and many midwifery texts describe. And when the whole is respected, you are most likely to have the birth of the placenta happen without incident, as this uh, frame shows. There is no problem giving birth to the placenta in the pool, though a good portion of women are ready to leave the pool soon after birth, in my experience. The placenta can often take three quarters of an hour or so to be born and about half the women have chosen to leave the pool before it comes. Even fewer remain in the pool to continue breastfeeding after the placenta is born. Cluett and Burns note that there are no placental water birth studies so everything that there is out there is empirical evidence. The movie The Birth of Ibus and the Practice Reflection and Knowledge Sharing section very clearly shows that process of birthing the placenta in the water. As this slide indicates, water birth is not a problem for healthy term infants and yet there is considerable opposition about water birth and its effect on the newborn from many paediatricians. Not all, you will see that one of the authors in the Darlin study, Mark Tracy, has Senior Newborn Intensive Care Specialist and Head of Department amongst his titles. I have put up Barbara Harper's critique of water birth safety in the reading. It's called Why Paediatricians Fear Water Birth, and it looks at that opposition. You may like to start some discussion about what support or otherwise there is for water birth in your area. I would like to pay tribute to Barbara Harper, who has consistently lit up the path to water birthing in an evidence-informed way. I have also put up an audio tape of an interview she gave about her journey to water birth. It is a good example of what can be achieved if you follow your passion. Ethel Burns and four of her colleagues reported on the prospective observational study they did between the years 2000 and 2008 in England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. They described and compared outcomes according to the different settings that women used pools, and these were in 15 obstetric units, five alongside midwifery units, nine freestanding midwifery units, in the homes of 155 women. 
There were nearly 9,000 women recruited and 55.5% of these were first-time birthers. They found women were more likely to birth in the pool and spend more time in it if they were at home. There was a nearly 89% spontaneous birth rate, of which just over 58% were water births. They classify these as normal births, but that doesn't necessarily mean they were physiological births, as we know interventions such as episiotomy, nitrous oxide and pethidine administration, to mention just a couple of things, feature in many so-called normal births. They summarise that labouring and or birthing in the water is an option that should be available for well women wherever they birth. And in relation to feedback and water birth, Diane Garland published an audit in 2006 that was carried out at Maidstone Hospital to see, as she framed it, if water birth was a safe and realistic option following previous caesarean section. 80 women out of 92 planned feedback after the screening process which looked at why the women previously had caesareans. Of these 80 women, 64 or 80 per cent subsequently birthed vaginally and 47 of these had spontaneous vaginal births. The remainder had instrument, instrumental births. Only 15 women used labour in water and 4 birthed in it, but all the women were able to use water if they wished. There were good outcomes for the mothers and babies who water birthed, as there were in all of the study. You will now have the opportunity to go into the resources that I have mentioned in this lecture, but before I f finish, I will give you some time to read this extract from Elizabeth Nutter's discussion. This ends the lecture.